very, very excited tonight um, to be with you. My name is uh, Diana Swanka, and I have the great pleasure of welcoming all of you who are here in Boston and via live stream all over the country, from Nashville to Oakland, Austin to Dallas, Florida, everywhere. I forgot Maine. There are people in Maine, right? Sorry. People in Maine, it's lovely to see you too. To this wonderful panel, Faith in Action, Poverty and the Racialization of the Economy. Poverty, race, and economy are, uh, to put it mildly, charged realities in very challenging times. Today, for example, the top 20% of income earners have taken 99.4% of all gains in wealth while the bottom 80% have just 0.6% to split amongst ourselves. Wall Street's 2016 bonuses, equivalent to $24 billion, were over one and a half times, wait for it, the total earnings of all full-time minimum wage workers in this country, the bonuses. Wages of most workers are basically stagnant, a whopping 94% of 9 million new jobs created in the past decade are temporary or contract-based. Half of all renters are, uh, spend over 30% of their income on rent. And the poorest 50% spend over half their income, excuse me, the poorest third spend over half their income on housing alone. By current estimates, 48 million of us are hungry. 43 million of us live below the poverty line. More than 6 million of us, our friends, our neighbors, ourselves, live on less than $2 a day. And almost every day, almost 600,000 of us do not have shelter over our heads. On top of this, we know it takes African American families 22 year, uh, excuse me, 228 years to earn the same amount of wealth white families have today. This is from the Economic Policy Institute. A recent Harvard Business Review uh, a study released October the 11th said that because of racial prejudice in hiring, black and Latinx families have no better a chance of getting a well-paid job than they did 25 years ago. The issues of poverty and race and economy are indeed charged realities in very, very challenging times. But there is hope for change, and we are really honored that our awesome panelists, uh, Drs. Cornell West, Peter Paris, Pamela Leitze, and Nimi Wanboko, are going to help us explore two things, two main things. First, how poverty, race and racism, and late U.S. capitalism interconnect. And second, what we individually and together can do to transform our society, to encourage the, encourage the sacred worth and full embrace of every single person among us. And second, to push for flourishing for all of us, refusing an individualism that is grasping and negates the loving worth of every human soul. I have a few other things I have to do before I get down, I'm sorry. Uh, one of them is to say thank you, and that's not a bad thing, that's a very good thing. Thank you, especially to you all, for, uh, for doing this tonight. All of them are doing this as a gift, a gift for you, for all of us. I want to thank the wonderful uh, volunteers who are serving as greeters, haulers, and cleaning crews. I want to thank the, B the BU School of Theology, especially the staff and administration, who's provided the bulk of the financial and technical support without which this night would not be possible. Special thanks to Dean Mary Elizabeth Moore for her early enthusiasm for the panel, to Pamela Leitze for working with me on the frame for the event and questions, and especially to Brian Stone for his great heart and for his work in support of this project. Deep thanks for sponsorship also go to the SDH Association of Black Seminarians, Hazel Johnson and the SDH Student Association, to Julian Cook and Pedro Falci of the Howard Thurman Center, and to the national nonprofit, the Poverty Consortium, all of whom have supported this event. We are deeply grateful. Finally, 
by way of introduction, I also want to thank Andrew Kimball and Jerry Ellis Jr. Behind me, okay. <laughs> Who, uh, the three of us have worked together on this project to make this night possible. And you are going to have two moderators, Andrew Kimball over here and Jerry Ellis Jr. over here, who are absolutely fantastic human beings, extraordinary scholars, loving, loving people, and they are going to guide us through the questions for the evening. Andrew is a brilliant graduate student of the, of the Boston Student uh, School of Theology, pursuing his Master of Divinity degree. He is a Morehouse grad who studied philosophy there, and then worked uh, in, as a conflict analyst and at Mennet and Phelps and Phillips. And instead of immediately attending law school, which he thought about doing, he decided to go on for an education in theology. He currently serves as the editor for The Prophet, which is a student uh, journal for STH. He's the president of the Association of Black Seminarians. And he's a graduate research as assistant at the Howard Thurman Center for Common Ground. Ger Gerald Ellis, Jr., who is uh, going to be taking the mic after um, uh, the introductions are over, already has a PhD in economics, and he has come back to the School of Theology for another degree, after which he is going to pursue another PhD. <laughs> I told him he's crazy, but he's not listening to me, and that's all right, um, because, because uh, uh, the world needs him. Um, he is um, extra an extraordinary man of integrity and honor and heart and love. He is uh, well published. He has worked in uh, very high flown academic institutions like MIT, for example, and Harvard. We'll mention Harvard, um, uh, as well as uh, Case Western, John Carroll, etc., and so forth. Um, uh, but Jerry's current project. Um, is in fact to work on poverty and economic justice issues. And that is what brought, has brought us together, for which I am um, profoundly grateful. My job at this point is to turn things over to Walter Fluker, the Matt Martin Luther King Jr. Chair um, uh, and Professor of Ethical Leadership. He is the editor of the Howard Thurman Papers Project and director of the MLK Jr. Initiative the development of ethical leadership at, at the U School of Theology. He is going to introduce our panelists, and I'm trying to think of what besides all of the extraordinary accomplishments, um, Dr. Fluker, to say about you, because I can just go on for an hour, and this is what I'm going to say. You are wonderful, beautiful, profound light, for whom we are deeply grateful. And it is my pleasure and my honor to ask you to come up now and to introduce our panelists. Thank you very much. It's a terrible joke by now, but um, I'm still going to say it. I'm going to do for you what Elizabeth Taylor did for her last hug. I'm not going to hold you long. <laughs> Thank you, Dr. Swancott. It is often the most humble and caring individuals who deserve our closest attention and emulation. This is the way I feel about Dr. Swancott's leadership in organizing this event along with Andrew Kimball and Gerald Ellis. I'm reminded of Nelson Mandela, who as a young man after his father's death, moved into the great palace, as it was called, to live with the paramount chief, or the regent. There he ran errands for chiefs and headmen who would come to the great palace to settle disputes and try cases. Mandela writes, as a leader, I always followed the principles I first saw demonstrated by the region at the Great Palace. I have always endeavored to listen to what each and every person in a discussion had to say before venturing my own opinion. Oftentimes, my opinion will, will simply represent a consensus of what I've heard in the discussion. 
I will always remember, Mandela writes, the region's axiom. A leader, he said, is like a shepherd. He stays behind the flock, letting the most nimble go out ahead, whereupon the others follow, not realizing that all along they were being led from behind. Thank you, Dr. Swankut, for leading from behind. I feel that I'm one of the most nimble in being afforded this opportunity to introduce this awesome panel tonight, and I'd like to get to it. Thank you. You're also a light. Dr. Pamela Leitze is the Associate Dean for Community Life and Lifelong Learning, Clinical Assistant Professor of Contextual Theology and Practice at the School of the Prophets, Austin University School of Theology. Pamela Leitze is a scholar, social justice activist, military veteran, and a United Methodist Church elder. Indeed, she's the first out African-American queer lesbian in the United Methodist Church. Her academic and research interests include just war theory, womanist theology, queer theology, queer theory, and African-American religious history and theology. As a scholar, she has written, among other works, the important book, Our Lives Matter, a womanist queer theology. And she served as co-chair of the American Academy of Religions, Womanist Approaches to Religion and Society Group, helping to lead the academy to recognize the profound importance of the theological and ethical scholarship and experiences of black women in America. As an activist, Dr. Lightsey has her feet on the ground. She's worked within the LBGTQ community to end Don't Ask, Don't Tell, to ensure marriage equality, and she continues to critique churches for homophobic polity, liturgy, and homiletics. Pamela Lightsey was on the ground protesting against excessive police force during the first 21 days of, arrest in, of unrest in Ferguson, Missouri and was one of several providing ongoing broadcasts across a one-year period. Dr. Lightsey has consistently collaborated with activist colleagues in the movement for the liberation of black lives, those addressing violence against black trans women, and institutional racism on college campuses. Thank you, Dr. Lightsey, for being here tonight. Dr. Mimi Warren. Dr. Mimi Warabogo, my distinguished colleague, is the Walter G. Mulder Professor of Social Ethics at the School of Theology, a lively transdisciplinary thinker. Dr. Warabogo is an expert whose scholarship interweaves economic ethics, Christian social ethics, African social traditions, Pentecostal studies, and philosophical theology. Put that in your pipe and smoke it. <laughs> Insights of which will no doubt inform tonight's discussion. God and Money, a Theology of Money in a Globalizing World, is a call for an alternative, inclusive global monetary system that can better support developing economics. The Pentecostal principle, ethical methodology in new spirit, develops a pneumatological, and for people who don't go to school in theology, that just means spirit. <laughs> uh, uh, a methodology out of spirit for ethics, for public policies and pluralistic communities, and another book, Economics in Spirit and Truth, A Moral Philosophy of Finance. I am so happy that he has joined our faculty at the School of Theology. Nick Warbolk. My beloved friend and colleague over the years, Dr. Peter J. Paris, the Elmer G. Hummer Causen, Professor Emeritus of Christian Social Ethics at Princeton Theological Seminary, worked closely also with the Princeton University African American Studies Program. It's no accident that he shared space 
with two other people who are on the panel tonight. I think sometimes spirit works overtime to bring certain kinds of people together. <laughs> Dr. Paris is a world-renowned scholar known for his teaching and research in ethics that matter. A widely honored visiting professor and fellow at Harvard University, Boston University School of Theology, and Union Theological Seminary in New York, and Trinity Theological College in Ghana, Dr. Paris formerly taught on the faculties of Vanderbilt University, Divinity School, and Howard School of Divinity. Dr. Paris is widely published, and his books include Religion and Poverty, Pan-African Perspectives, Virtues and Values, The African and African American Experience, The Spirituality of African Peoples, The Search for a Common Moral Discourse, and Black Religious Leaders, conflict and unity. In other publications, he has focused on ethical formation, preaching and social justice, globalization, public theology, <laughs> Martin Luther King Jr.'s legacy, and the interaction of race, gender, and religion. Last but not least, feels like a family affair. <laughs> Dr. Cornell West needs no introduction, but he deserves one. He's a prominent and provocative democratic intellectual. He is professor of the practice of public philosophy at Harvard, at Harvard University and holds the title of professor emeritus at Princeton University. He has also taught at Union Theological Seminary, Yale University, Harvard University, and the University of Paris. Cornell West graduated magna cum laude from Harvard in three years and obtained his MA and PhD in philosophy at Princeton. He has written 20 books and has edited 13. I don't know how you do it, but you do it. <laughs> he is best known for his classics, Race Matters and Democracy Matters, and for his memoir, Brother West, Living and Loving Out Loud. His most recent book, Black Prophetic Fire, offers an unflinching look at 19th and 20th century African American leaders and their visionary legacies. Dr. West is a frequent guest on Bill Maher's show, CNN, C-SPAN, and Democracy Now. He's made his film debut in The Matrix and was the commentator with Ken Wilbur on the official trilogy released in 2004. Been living a long time, brother. <laughs> he has produced three spoken word albums, including Never Forget, collaborating with Prince, Jill Scott, Andre 3000, and the likes of others. His spoken word interludes are featured on productions by Terrence Blanchard, The Cornell West Theory, and so on. It's just an incredible life, Dr. West. I'm glad you're here. Brother West, and I want to begin this last statement with a lot of love for everyone here and for something that Dr. West has said before that I want us all to think about tonight. There is a price, he says, to pay for speaking the truth. There is a bigger price for living a lie. Thank you. Friends and colleagues, thank you for inviting me to participate on this panel. It is a great honor to be back in this school where I recently spent two years as a visiting professor. It is even a greater honor to converse with best friends and colleagues on a subject of immense importance to us all. Yet, it is, not, is it not amazing that we find ourselves once again discussing a subject about which we have so much experience 
and knowledge, a subject that has been measured by numerous sciences throughout the 20th and 21st centuries. The racialization of the economy for African Americans is a subject that cannot be understood apart from the captivity of Africans for two and a half centuries in chattel slavery that was followed by another century of legal and customary discrimination and segreg segregation that included systems of conflict, convict leases in agriculture, coal and steel mining that gradually morphed into sharecropping, mass migration, urban ghettoization, mass incarceration, and much more. The residue of that bitter history is now seen in the many negative attitudes that white Americans continue to have about black Americans, that view them as lazy, inferior, and content with being on the public dole. Moreover, they view all visible advances of the race as wholly undeserving. This year is the 500th anniversary of the Protestant Reformation. It was begun by a German monk, Martin Luther, in 1517, two decades after Christopher Columbus discovered a race of people in the Americas that he considered excellent commodities for slavery, colonization, and later genocide. All of this was officially sponsored by the Spanish crown and blessed by the Roman Catholic Church. Luther hung his 93 theses on the door of the Wittenberg Church just two decades before the British ship of war sold the first African slaves in Virginia, an act that launched the transatlantic slave trade, an enterprise that existed for two and a half centuries when it came to an end following a long bitter civil war the residual effects of which remain up to the present day. And thus America's so-called great experiment in democracy was born in the context of a slaveocracy that was superseded by similar systems of oppression characterized by peonage and the already mentioned forms of systematic convictions of the most minor for the most minor offenses, convict leasing and sharecropping sharecropping. Those systems were controlled by contract owners that treated their laborers with impunity. And as a result, lynching, whipping, raping, and maiming were widespread practices well into the 20th century. Between the First and Second World Wars, a mass migration of blacks from the southern to the northern states improved their economic condition within the threatening, ubiquitous racist practices in housing, labor unions, building and trade unions, all white collar jobs, higher education, police and military forces, the professions, etc. In short, racial discrimination and segregation permeated all dimensions of the American society and denied equal access to the necessary resources for a better life. In their two-volume work in 1940, Black Metropolis Anthropologist, called Black Metropolis, anthropologist Horace Caton and sociologist Sinclair Drake provided a full-scale study of a city within a city separated by race. Nearly two decades later, the 1967 President Lyndon Johnson's National Advisory Committee on Civil Disorders, known later as the Otto Kerner Report, concluded that the nation was moving towards two societies, one black and the other white, separate and equal. Unless conditions were mem remedied, the country faced a system of apartheid in, in, in its largest, in its major cities. The report angered the president to such an extent that no action was taken on its recommendations. In the following year, Martin Luther King Jr. and Robert F. Kennedy were assassinated. Within a two-month period, deaths that were linked to the then recent martyrs in the struggle for racial justice, namely 
President John F. Kennedy, uh, NAACP Secretary Medgar Evers, and the iconic Malcolm X. Clearly the so-called Jim Crow era in America, in American racial segregation and discrimination were practiced throughout the country with varying degrees of intensity between the South and the North. Most important, the denial of the rights and privileges of citizenship to blacks have always enabled the poorest of whites to feel themselves superior to all blacks because their race was never the basis for denying them citizenship rights. Equal access to public schools did not become lawful for blacks until 1954, Brown versus the Board of Education, and never fully enforced throughout the nation. The right to full and equal citizenship became law in the Civil Rights Act of 1964 and the Voters' Rights Act of 1965. Interracial marriages became lawful in the Loving and State of, of Virginia decision in 1967. All of this and much more evidences the countless obstacles blacks face throughout their history in the United States. Obstacles that have prevented them from achieving economic and social parity with, with, with white Americans, not only in the past, but in our present day, as clearly evidenced by the 2016 election of Donald Trump as president. His campaign began eight years earlier with a so-called birther movement that he launched, claiming that President Obama was illegitimately in office because he is a Muslim and was born in Kenya. Now, Trump's primary mission is to destroy Obama's legacy with the tacit support of the Republican Party. Now, racial injustice is not a natural occurrence. Rather, it is a series of intentional acts to obstruct blacks in the pursuit of their citizenship rights. The persistence of racism ensures that blacks are more likely than whites to live in poverty, be unemployed, lack medical care, home ownership, adequate retirement pensions, etc. Much energy and imagination have been expended from one generation to the next in maintaining this injustice in a two-party political system, both of which has been complicit with its practice. Finally, as an emphasis, I am primarily concerned about justice and injustice. That is receiving or not receiving what one deserves. More often than not, African Americans have been denied and continue to be denied what they deserve as both humans and citizens. Such denial continues a gross injustice that has been discussed, protested, and legislated against for generations yet it continues with no end in sight. Apart from some form of reparations, even if the country were to begin treating blacks equally with whites, it would take generations for the races to be on a par because racial inequality has already existed for 400 years with perilous consequences for us all. And thus the persistence of racism is the clearest possible evidence that black lives do not matter. All forms of resistance mirror the Sisyphus myth with one distinction. Sisyphus was being punished for his self-aggrandizement and deceitfulness, while blacks have been punished for their humanity. Sadly, the meaninglessness of the Sisyphean myth would render the struggle against racism both tragic and absurd. Yet survival necessitates the cyclical motion of hard work, moral appeals, legitimate protests, and other forms of resistance. Yet blacks live insecure, insecurely in the gap between survival and the good life. Thank you very much.
my very fine colleagues who are with us tonight. I'm, I was just really taken by that very fine historical and ethical analysis given by my colleague. And I mean, a, a man whose work I have just really uh, been blessed to read throughout the years, Dr. Peter Paris. And I want to thank you again for that fine job. If you believe in social equality, if you believe that black people have made significant vocational and economic gains, the more you believe this is true across the board for black people and brown people, the less aware you are of actual racial economic inequality. According to a recent Yale study, for every $100 of wealth that a white family has, the black family has only accumulated $5 and some change. $5 and some change for every $100 white wealth. Now, unless you think that's new, it really is not a new phenomenon. This gap has persisted for decades. And as the study uh, wrote, it has persisted for, for over 50 years. This ain't new. Audre Lord once said, institutionalized Rejection of difference is an absolute necessity in a profit economy which needs outsiders as surplus people. Capitalism is framed on racialized economic hierarchy, hierarchies. If we're looking for a boogeyman, in a long tale of racial economic inequality, it is this consistently troubling mode of production that falsely promises us freedom and equality, but in truth is only realized by a very small percentage of people. Corporate feudalism, corporate feudalism is real. One in six workers in America live in poverty. This is not people who are not working. One in six workers in America, one in six people who get up every day, put on clothes, make their way through subway stations, are sitting in traffic for at least two or three hours a day. One in six people in America live in poverty. Out on the streets, agitating for justice, I have only to look around the neighborhood, see the dilapidated houses, see the mom and pop businesses that have been shut down, look at the quick cash and credit pariahs in the communities. <coughs> Look at the gentrification of our communities and see all the signs of capitalism and how capitalism is not only turning on the laborers, the, product, the producers, but how capitalism is also turning on itself. But mostly, for our time tonight, I want to, with my time, and with what I want to offer, I want to speak tonight about a concern uh, that I have as a child who grew up in poverty, whose mother was a domestic worker, AKA, otherwise known as a maid, uh, whose father was a day laborer, caught a truck to work whatever truck that came on the corner and picked both him and Latino brothers up for work, uh, who lived near Skid Row 
in the city of West Palm Beach, which is just across the bridge from the most wealthiest neighborhood in America, that is Palm Beach. I want to speak from that context because it is from that context that I have turned my attention to as a scholar over and over again. And it's because I know that people in that context, that my family, that my friends, that my community are, are, are not, are doing the most, or as an insurance agent once told me, the mostest with the leastest. And I'm always amazed at how impoverished people and how my family and how we were able to survive and thrive and make do, as we said in the South, with what we had. And so I'm, I don't want to come here and present a picture of black and brown people who are living in poverty, but who are impoverished in their spirits. I don't want to perpetuate that lie. Because poverty is a state of capitalism. It is not a state of the human being. I want you to remember that. I'm concerned about how racialization of our economy harms the most vulnerable, the children, the poorest among us. 13,253,000 children in America live in poverty. 13 million 253,000 human beings, the youngest of our nation, live in poverty. One in four black and brown children suffer disproportionately from poverty. 20 to 40 percent of the homeless are LGBTQ youth. LGBTQ youth who, when they came out, were put out of their homes. And since LGBTQ children of color suffer in larger numbers among this group, I feel it's important as an LGBTQ adult to remind you of the flesh and, and, and blood and bone human beings who are out on the streets suffering from poverty. Suffering economically, educationally, they are abused physically and sexually, they are denied the benefits of fair and equal legal representation, and all of this despite the combined personal income of our nation, which has eclipsed to $13 trillion. 13000 253,000, 13,253,000 children live in poverty, and yet our combined nation's in per income is $13 trillion. America's top 1% now control 38, 39% of the nation's wealth. The income shares of those at the lowest levels of our economy continue to decrease. And before I sit down, I remind you that we are living in a plutocracy. 45 became the first billionaire president in our nation's history. And he brought with him not the cleaning out of the swamp, but he brought with him and comprised his, his cabinet, the secretaries of his cabinet, with this nation's most wealthiest people, a cabinet of billionaires. 13,253,000 children live in poverty. The nation's capital is comprised now of some of the richest people in America making laws that will hurt 13,253,000 children. Thank you.
see it manifest in the eloquent words of our brother and our sister, and of course our brother to come, and the two questionnaires here. I'm going to be very brief because I won't dialogue, I won't antiphonal form, I won't call in a response. But just listening to these two does put me on fire that I have to acknowledge. Uh, this moment of spiritual blackout, that's what we're wrestling with today, the relative eclipse of integrity and honesty and decency and generosity. It's a moment that encourages callousness and rewards indifference. And Rabbi Abraham Joshua Heschel is right, indifference to evil is more insidious than evil itself. William James is right, that indifference is the one trait that makes the very angel weep. And that's what we're dealing with. But it's tied to imperial meltdown. You can't talk about the economy without talking about the American empire. Every dollar spent, 53 cents, go to the military industrial complex. The adventurism. 4,855 military units around the world in 140 countries with U.S. special operations with budgets that are unlimited. So already you got a truncated framework in even talking about the capitalist economy that my dear sister was laying bare with such insight and power of discernment. And I just want to accent just three processes in terms of keeping track of our precious and our priceless poor brothers and sisters of all colors, but disproportionately chocolate. One is the financialization of the economy in which commodification is ubiquitous everywhere, runs them up, everybody for sale, everything for sale, reinforcing a neoliberal soul craft in which the aim of life is smartness, richness, and bombs to be dropped in order for us to be safe. And that's spiritual blackout. So that market moralities and market mentalities push out love. And I come from a people who've been hated for 400 years and taught the world so much about how to love. The John Coltrane love supreme is no joke. The Marvin Gaye's what's going on is no joke. The Martin Luther King Jr.'s life of love. James Baldwin's love so carefully. Essays I come from a people who taught the world so much about what love is about in the face of 400 years of terror and trauma and stigma and hatred and contempt. So Donald Trump ain't nothing new for black people. Amen. Whatsoever. Just part of the cycle. Part of what we've been wrestling with when the first slave stepped off that slave ship and encountered the slave auction and had to explain to their precious child, this is the kind of life we're going to live. But we're going to say the same thing that Emma Till's mother said when she had to put her baby in the ground. I refuse to hate. I will pursue justice for the rest of my life. That's not spiritual blackout at all. That's a mustering the courage. To have a vision and a vocation and a sense of what it is to be human in the face of catastrophe. America specializes in being, dealing with the problematic, but when you're dealing with poverty and empire and racism and transphobia and homophobia, you're dealing with the catastrophic. Never confuse the problematic with the catastrophic. America claims to be problem solving, but they deny the catastrophic. And Malcolm is right, chickens do come home to roost. You're going to reap what you sow. Sooner or later, what's in the wash is going to be manifest. That's what we're dealing with at this particular moment. Capitalist forms in which 1% of, not just on that 39%, but as financial service says, when I was the age of the precious students here at this institution, it was American Motors where the major capitalists produce products. Now it's Wall Street and banks and the major elites produce deals as opposed to goods. And therefore you can't even deal with wages increasing as the profits increase because the real economy has little to do with the level of Wall Street speculation in which forms of profit and then all the crimes that take place inside of trading, market manipulation, fraudulent activity, predatory lending, and not one Wall Street executive goes to jail but let Jamal and Leticia or Juanita and Carlos get caught on the corner with crack bad. They're going to stick to jail. An integral part, the mass incarceration regime, an integral part.
constitutive of the financialization of a capitalist economy in which, yes, it is disproportionately affecting black people and brown people and indigenous people and yellow people. But we got to keep contact with the way class dynamics and imperial dynamics impinge upon the lives of our precious citizens, including our citizens of color. So that commodification goes hand in hand with the niggerization of the economy. I know I don't want to be too harsh on those who came up at this title. But racialization is a little bit too deodorized for me. I like to keep it funky. <laughs> oh, yeah, I'm the boots of college. And to keep it funky means you want to be highly suspicious of those constructors like diversity as opposed to white supremacy. <laughs> diversity as opposed to male supremacy. Diversity as opposed to homophobia, transphobia, and so forth. Those are bureaucratic constructs that's fine for the administrators, but when it comes to truth telling, the condition of truth is always to allow suffering to speak. And sooner or later, the rocks will cry out, no matter how deodorized your discourse. So niggerization is about what? Vicious legacy of white supremacy in which the exploitation of black labor, the demeaning of black bodies, and to convince peoples of color they're less beautiful, less intelligent, less moral, and most importantly, to keep them so afraid and scared and intimidated, doubting themselves, thinking they somehow they cannot come together, trust themselves, expand their sense of who they are, and walking around acting as if they have to defer to the status quo, laughing when it ain't funny, scratching when it don't itch, wearing the mask, consenting to their own domination and exploitation and deep. That's also what's happening. The ways in which capitalist commodification and niggerization kick in. And then there's militarization, and I'm going to sit down. The militarizing of our schools, the militarizing of family, the vicious patriarchal violence against women of cowardly, insecure males, the losing sight of our precious trans folk, gay brothers and lesbian sisters, that fundamental myth of the American empire, which is what? Frontier, what is frontier? Moral regeneration through violence by attacking those characterized as savages, as subhuman, as others. That's one of the ways in which America undergoes spiritual revival to reinforce its spiritual black out. And we're here in the tradition of this institution of Boston University to say, no, we want prophetic fight back even if it looks like we got the chance of a snowball in hell. It's better to go down swinging with your integrity and honesty and decency than to win and be a gangster like those who rule. Even the winner of the rat race is still a rat. That's a spiritual, moral judgment. And that's what's so beautiful about the younger generation they are disproportionately undergoing a moral and spiritual awakening that's leaving many of our churches and mosques and synagogues and other civic institutions and even our universities themselves undergoing corporatization and mar marketization as well. And that's a sign of hope, but I don't believe in discourses of hope at all. They've been colonized by neoliberal politicians. I believe in being a hope. Don't say a word about hope, just be a hope.
that lead to poverty. Because poverty and self-discrimination is not an accident. It's integral to the way the US economy operates. So first of all, what is racialization? Racialization of the economy, in a sense, refers to the structural inequalities that exist in the United States that are key to, marked, and driven by race or skin color discrimination. We can begin to grasp that economically. Number two, it means that the resolution of the economy points to the increasing vulnerability of the citizens of color to early death and low life expectancy. Number three, racialization is the near monopoly of benefits, positions, opportunities of the US economy by whites and other racially privileged groups that monopolize. So when we are talking about racialization, we're talking about monopolization of positions, benefits, and opportunities. So we can begin to operationalize what it means. Number four, racialization of the economy is a form of exclusion of minorities from the necessary economic, social, and public resources in a way that destroy their capacity to actualize their God-given potential. Mm -hmm. So racialization destroys your capacity to be a human being. Mm -hmm. You are excluded from the resources of this country. But uh, either political, economic, social, you are excluded. That's what in practical terms it means. And finally, racialization of the economy is a form of police logic of the U.S. empire, which renders certain racial groups permanent part of no part, making them part of the, demo, of the demography or the politics or the economy that do not count. Basically, you, you are being racialized when you do not count. It's part of the police logic of the U.S. empire. The combined result of, of the logic and dynamics of these five dimensions of racialization is absolute and relative poverty of minority groups. The, the twin result of poverty and, and racialization is not accidental to the Mahon logic and social imaginary of the society, polity, and economy of the United States. It's not accidental. It's fundamental. Poverty and racism define America as much as wealth and military power. Poverty and, and racialization mark America as much as the stars and stripes mark the national flag. Racialization of the US economy is like the five point star of the Star Spangled Banner, with each point oozing poverty into the social fabric of the nation. The whole assemblage of the star and stripes of poverty and race are set in order and driven by what Emily Towns called fantastic hegemonic imagination. There is an invidious imagination that holds firmly the systematic structural evil of poverty and racialization in the economy. Such imagination politicizes economic statistics to secure subordination, uh, subordination economic impopularization, and immiserization of minority groups. In short, poverty is a product of racism as a cultural production of evil. What are the five points of this star that drip poison and poverty, human degradation, and strangulation of hope? What are these five, the, the five points of the US star? What are these points that kills dreams for star human promotion? When some people see the star and strike the banner, they celebrate. But when some of us see it, we see each point of those star, those five hundred star, as points of poison that are that are flowing into the US economy. First, anytime you look at this star, and, and these days we are crying about how we live or how we salute the flag. But anytime you look at this at the star, each of those stars have five points. I want you to remember. Those five points will tell you about racialization and poverty of the US economy. The first point is that there is a special production of poverty. There is a geographic dynamic to poverty in this country. Minorities and people of color are often living in zones and places where there are few opportunities for economic improvement. 
We have talked about income inequality. It's time to speak about spatial inequality. Because the spaces you grow up in this country determine your fortune. What kind of opportunities are available for you to realize your life, uh, God giving potential, depends on where you grow up, the zones. Certain, just by growing up in certain portions of the country, certain zip codes, you are condemned for poverty. To poverty for, for the rest of your life, God knows. The second point relates to wealth accumulation. Now, this is talking about Thomas Piketty and Joseph. Uh, 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 Steve, like in the recent book, are showing alarming growth rates of income inequality in this country. For black folks and people of color, the condition is worse than what is portrayed in their studies. The household incomes of blacks is lower on the average than that of whites. The unemployment rates among minorities are higher than that of whites. We know that. Piketty says income inequality will worsen in the future because because of the capital accumulated by the richest 1% of the American uh, society. Now, the, the rate of growth of cap capital in this country, what accumulation is said, is faster than the economy is growing. So we are going to see more of wealth inequality. For, so he captures this with an equation. And people living in Harvard, others could print up t shirt wearing R greater than G. That is, how it means the return to capital is greater than the growth of the overall economy. So income inequality and wealth uh, inequality is going to increase. According to him, we are back in the days of patrimonial capitalism. That is what we are. My minorities have less of inherited capital, and generally they do not own the capital, which rate of growth exceeds the rate of growth of the economy. So all they can talk about in his book, so two points only to talk about. Uh, rate of growth of capital higher than the rate of growth economy. The minorities do not even have the capital that grows. They do not uh, uh, have it. Plus, are, are not watching the gyration of Piketty's, uh, Piketty's now famous equation, R equals greater than G. Rather, R greater than G is watching black folks, mocking their absence from the urges of accumulation and exploitation. Whites are today landing and dancing on Piketty's rock of wealth. Tomorrow, Piketty's rock of wealth will land on blood. And the day after tomorrow, rocks from the hands of poor whites, Asians and Hispanic, will fly on the streets of America. As long as this rock of wealth that everybody is celebrating, as let us remember, Macomo said, he said, they landed at Clifford Rock. The Clifford Rock landed at us. Today, the rock of the wealth is our greater than she. And tomorrow is going to land on blacks and Hispanic. The, the crushing effect of inequality and wealth accumulation is going to land on us. But there is hope that as those rocks are landing on minorities, Rocks will also fly on the streets to restore this country to his um, hopes. Another point of the star that drifts his poison into black lives is fairly school system. Black minorities and children of the poor in this country are not given the kind of education that will prepare them for the economy of tomorrow. Add to this the digital divide between minorities and white be between the rich and the poor, and you catch the vision of the children of, of black folks being subjected to economic debt tomorrow. We're not just talking about what's happening about today. Given all these facts, our children are dead before they are dead before they are even born. If this all this means that the cruel income and wealth gaps between whites and black. A veritable indicator of rationalization of the economy will only widen in the future. The fourth poisonous point of the five point star is prison industrial complex. We have a criminal system that, we have a justice system that seems to target minorities to either kill them on the street, <laughs> judicially execute them, or imprison them in mass, 
the mass as a way of keeping our streets safe for the rich class and for the triumph of capitalism. That is one of the poisonous points of the five point star empire system of the United States. Finally, we must direct our attention to the differential in the Human Development Index of the various racial groups in this country. The Human Development Index, as released by the UN, is a critical measure of human welfare and life expectancy in this country. And according to the latest report that just, 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 just came out, that, that, that blacks and uh, Hispanic have the lowest human development index, in most cases, lower than developing countries. And, and, and so, this, the sum total of all the way the five hundred staff, the five hundred empire operated, it reduces the human development index, the human capital, the, the, the welfare of, of, yeah, 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 of minorities. And in this year's report, the UN has this to say in that report on page 80. He said, African American life expectancy is shorter than that of other ethnic and racial groups in the United States. African Americans will train whites and Asian Americans in education and wages. Whites end to 7% more on the average. In some metropolitan areas, the disparity is particularly striking. The life expectancy of African Americans in Baltimore, Chicago, Detroit, Pittsburgh, uh, 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 and Tampa is now close to the national average in the 1970s. So blacks have moved back 40 years in life expectancy. As bad as it was, that is where we are, that we are today. And that's what the UN report just came out to say. He said, the reasons are complex that linked, this is the UN report said, the reasons are complex that linked to a long history of legal and social discrimination. Policies that improve educational achievement can expand opportunities for African Americans and other racial and ethnic minorities in work and other areas. Equalizing educational achievement will reduce disparity in employment between African Americans and whites by 53%, incarceration by 79%, and health, health outcomes by 88%. Differences in wages between African Americans and whites are also related to what? Discrimination in the job, yeah, in the job market. And finally, it says this discrimination accounts for an estimated one third of the wage disparity, all else, including education, being equal. This indicates that policies are needed to ensure that skills and education are rewarded equally. So, just by even dealing with this issue of discrimination, you're also going to affect the prison rate. So many things. And then, when they do all this study, that a good part of the disparity is because racial discrimination still goes strongly in this and is part of the US, the logic of the US empire. Thank you. As Jerry prepares the next question, we want to remind the panelists to please turn on the body microphones. The body microphones.
the current systemic and long-term historical reasons for this. And part B, finally, low-income earners and vulnerable populations, for example, kids, disabled, and the elderly, are kept poor. Why? Wow. Wow. I'm going to be very brief because we've got so many rich voices and we want to hear from the audience, too. Um, but I think it's very significant that our dear brother Martin Luther King Jr. zero in on this issue 50 years ago. And we've yet to give a substantive answer to his movement. Thank God, Reverend Dr. William Barr, who just embarked on a poor people's campaign, not by himself, but like Martin didn't do it by himself. The movement makes the women and men, just as the women and men who lead make the movement. Uh, but the fact that the issue of poverty is constitutive of a capitalist economy, constitutive of an empire, but it has much to do with the fact we don't have enough citizens who care. The ruling elites are going to do what they do unless there is significant power and pressure brought to bear in organized ways that make them do things they don't want to do. And this is true for the black middle classes. Everybody knows that if Jack and Jill, brothers and sisters, were going to jail at the same level of intensity as our precious brothers and sisters in the hood, we'd have a different kind of black leadership. There'd be a discourse on poverty. But it's not caring enough. And the question is, why is it? How do we live in a country where we have normalized mendacity and naturalized criminality? That level of poverty that we're talking about is a crime against humanity. But we naturalize it, business as usual. That's what Martin was trying to tell us. That's what Fannie Lou, Hammer Haber, and, and, and Ella Baker were trying to tell us. And here we are now, 50 years later, and it's worse. After black president, after black attorney general, after black handling on homeland security, where are the voices talking about poverty with a neoliberal black president? He didn't mention the word until he was fifth, fifth year in. Didn't talk about the mass industrial, mass incarceration regime until seven years. Didn't hit white supremacy in any significant way until the seventh year. It, 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 it erodes our moral credibility to act as if we're so concerned about poverty now that we got a neo-fascist in the White House. But when we had a neoliberal black man in the White House, people didn't want to talk about the legacy of Martin Luther King Jr. They wanted to allow Martin Luther King Jr to be colonized and sanitized by neoliberal black folk who got smile and smart, but still reproducing hierarchy close to Wall Street, dropping dr drone strikes on indigenous, on, on, on babies in Yemen and Somalia, and didn't want to say a hardly a mumbling word. Where is the constancy? Where is the consistency in our Christian and religious witness? But neoliberal ain't nothing but privatized, militarized, and financialized in the face of every problem. And it always falls short. And it reproduces neoliberal soul craft, no. which is to be smart as opposed to wise and compassionate, which is to be rich as opposed to sacrificial and serving the least of these and to drop bombs. How many bombs were dropped? 26,172 drowned bombs dropped in 2016. There's human beings under those bombs. Where were our voices then? And I'm not saying that I know all of y'all in, in the movement, but I'm talking about folks from outside of this room. <laughs> folks somewhere else. <laughs> so that this issue is one in which we got a whole lot to learn. We're not reinventing the wheel. Brother Martin and the others gave all they had kenosis of love and service and willing to die to accent the same issues that now we come back to in worse shape with the neo-fascists now trying to run things. So that's the beginning of an answer, brothers, an inadequate answer. But it's my hint and guess as to how to wrestle with your profound query. <laughs> <laughs> I 
understand. <laughs> In your introduction, several of you kind of alluded to this question. How and why is it important to talk about justice for racially and ethnically minoritized peoples distinct from discussions of economics education? And how and why is it important to talk about the interconnections? Yes. <laughs> How and why is it important to talk about justice for racially, ethnically minoritized peoples distinct from discussions of economic subjugation? And how, is, how and why are the interconnections important? The, the two things, especially in this country, is, is connected because the people who are often at the other side of economic injustice who are suffering are oftentimes also minorities. Now, that does not mean that there are no white folks that are suffering. So to begin to see it as two distinct issues is, is to drive on a necessary wedge. The, the issue is there is profound economic injustice in this in this country. We can look look at all this, all the sites we will be we can see that both both blacks, brown and white are suffering from the hands of neoliberal capitalism. But oftentimes, it is also, also, also clear that sometimes the issue of racism or white supremacy might blind or color some people not to see that we are all subjugated by capitalism. And, 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 and so oftentimes, the, the issue of economic justice is, is quickly translated into as if racial groups or groups fighting one another, or there is, there is conflict, rather than seeing a common uh, enemy. Like what Brother West was, was, was showing there, we are, we are too quick to see and, and, and believe that the Democrats are different from the Republicans. But the leadership of the Democrats and Republicans are in bed with new, uh, neoliberal capitalism. And we need to understand that. So often they say, oh, because Obama was, was there as a Democrat, it doesn't make a difference. The U.S. economy, as led by the leaders of both parties, have one purpose, to serve capitalism and to serve it very well. And if we realize that, it moves this. So the economic injustice is there. We are in a country where wages have not moved up, wealth, wealth and equality have, have increased. But you would, you would think that, that there should be some kind of movement on the street to say, we are not going to allow this. Because the way it is going, as studies have shown, the level of inequality today is it's as much as the 19th or 18th century. So we are living worse than our ancestors. And yet, there is no movement towards it. And yet, there is, there is no willingness to even look at the economic uh, justice. You see that even with uh, in, in my uh, experience is teaching in uh, seminars at different places, that you find that, that even people who are interested in fighting social justice, they are at least interested in understanding the economic dy uh, dynamics. I teach uh, economic justice courses or so. Oftentimes, you beg students to enroll. And I say, if you are really going to fight this battle, you don't want to be educated about the economic dynamics of its injustice. So, so people are not really informed about the level of economic injustice in this country. If, if, the, if they are made aware, I don't know, there is, even in the news, in the press, it's not always there. Once in a while, the book will come up on a panel like this, we'll discuss it. I think we need to get people to aware that the level of uh, economic injustice is beyond what even Martin uh, saw. It's way beyond what anybody has experience. It, it goes back, it's at worst as going back as if before 200 years ago, well, it, we, we, uh, uh, black folks were, 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 were slaves. But now it appears everyone has been enslaved to serve capitalism. And yet, we're not even aware that we are slaves to the capitalist system now. And, and more so, even our university students are not aware. A lot of people going to colleges. The student debt, $1 trillion. I mean, their life is mortgaged before they are, 
They didn't get out of school. And there's no awareness on campus. You would think that in the 60s, people would fight. Students of, of today are more indebted than their parents or grandparents. And yet, there is no awareness. You should begin to ask yourself the question, why is that level of apathy? Why is that level of ignorance taking place? What it means that so the students of today, they are like the poster child of capitalism because they are being exploited by Wall Street driven financialization of the American university system. And no one is raising a peep about it. And I think we should see all this here, here as well connected. conversation about racism, uh, economic injustice. Uh, because Slovakracy itself was supported by economic injustice. Uh, the uh, channel system itself is a system of economic injustice. So, if I, and as I think about what is going on in our cities, in our, I mean, I came here from Chicago. Uh, one has but to look at the city itself, look at how the neighborhoods have been constructed. The neighborhoods are constructed uh, on a system of racial injustice. And uh, people have lost their homes, have been segregated in their neighborhoods, all to support uh, capitalistic, racist uh, society. So I don't know that I can ever talk about the plight of black people in America, the plight of brown people in America, without talking about economic injustice. And as I think about white supremacy, you know, we're here today and down in my home state of Florida, you know, white supremacy has wrapped itself under, uh, has wrapped itself up under the, the, the guise of free speech. But white supremacy is making a lot of money off of this guise of free speech. And, and the institutions, the academic institutions are spending a lot of capital to uh, supposedly to protect its students against white supremacy, but within the institution itself is white supremacy that attacks even the hearts and the minds of black and brown students by, by the um, curriculum itself. So how do you divorce yourself economically? As a black or brown person in, in America, how do, you, how do you remove yourself from the injustice of uh, economic uh, oppression, wherever, whether it's in your neighborhood, 